revolves around um, these four individuals. So uh, on the top left, King Trebuvan, who um, took asylum in, in India in 1950 uh, and joined an anti-Rana rebellion um, and returned in triumph to Kathmandu in 1951. And this is a postage stamp showing him waving to his nation as he steps off the plane on that day. Um, <coughs> Trebuvan came back to, to Nepal promising a parliamentary system uh, and the election of a, an assembly that would draft a new constitution, but this was never delivered. Um, and his son, King Mahendra, who took over for him uh, after he died in 1955, in the, the man in the sunglasses, um, presided over a, a decade of political uncertainty leading up to Nepal's first general elections in 1959. Uh, this was won by the Nepali Congress Party, whose leader is in the bottom right, BP Koirala. Um, but this was again cancelled. Democracy was effectively cancelled in December 1960 by King Mahendra, who uh, went on to establish a new regime, which he called the Panchayat system, uh, under which all political parties were banned uh, and the king became effectively the single fault of, of political power and the sole executive power in the country. Um, this uh, was continued by King, the late King Virendra in the bottom left of the slide uh, after his coronation in 1972. The, um, my own angle on Nepal is, is, has always been first and foremost a literary one and there are interesting reflections in Nepali literature of, the kinds of, of these kinds of political changes and one of the most famous uh, poems uh, of Nepali literature is, is one by, by Vupi Shacha, whose biography I published three years ago. Uh, entitled in Nepali, Hami, which means we. Um, and it's a sardonic uh, representation of King Mahendra's royal coup of 1960, saying, you know, we Nepalis are men of Lilliput, uh, we worship Gulliver, we can't do anything of our own accord, we need a big man to move us around to tell us what to do. Um, somehow or other, he escaped, <laughs> he escaped the censorious tendencies of the government um, when he published this because it was perhaps ambiguous, but in retrospect its meaning is quite clear. So there ensued 30 years of the partyless panchayat system of limited democracy. Um, this involved massive externally funded uh, development, um, which led to substantial improvements in, in living standards for, for some of Nepal's population, and a massive increase in all the other indicators, such as the threats of, of national literacy. But all the patterns of, of marginalization and equality that had, had been established really in the early years of the Rana period um, persisted, um, and all political parties and all organizations representing any kind of sectional interest uh, were banned unless they had been formed by the Panchayat authorities themselves. So there was no political freedom uh, for those who wished to work against or outside the kind of palace-sponsored political system. Um, and the palace was eff effectively the only real source of, of power or, or patronage. The panchayat system came to an end um, in 1990, um, partly as a consequence <coughs> of um, a disagreement, let us say, between the governments of Nepal and India. Um, and these are two, I, I, I excavated these from my filing cabinet a few months ago, two pieces of propaganda that were circulated by the Nepal Embassy and the Indian High Commission in London at the time. Um, as, as, as Alice has explained, I've been, been around uh, in Nepali studies for a while, so it becomes archaeologically interesting as these things go on. I never fully understood the, the, the ins and outs of this, but effectively the, the trade and transit treaties between India and Nepal had expired, and either India had blockaded Nepal or Nepal had misbehaved by trying to buy armaments from China against uh, the agreement between the two governments. Anyway, it led to um, a closure of many of the, the crossing points across the Indo-Nepalese border um, and economic hardship, particularly for the new emerging middle class in, in Kathmandu who could no, no longer acquire imported, imported goods. So this provided the, the economic background um, for uh, massive discontent, particularly among the growing urban middle class, and 
the political parties which had been there uh, underground throughout the Panchayat period uh, mobilized against the Panchayat system. This is a report from the London newspaper, The, um, the Observer. Um, so Dina will note that the, uh, the kind of cliches <laughs> Um, repeat in other contexts too. Um, so a democracy movement um, arose in the late 89, 90, early 1990 in Kathmandu and succeeded in persuading the, the king to uh, abolish the Panchayat system and re-establish a multi-party um, democracy. A new constitution was promulgated in November 1990 which defined Nepal as a multi-ethnic, multilingual, democratic, independent, indivisible sovereign, but still Hindu and still constitutional monarchical kingdom. Um, it left the palace still in charge of the Royal Nepalese Army. It left the palace still with emergency powers, um, as Mahendra had used back in 1960 to uh, dismiss the, the government of Bibi Kaurala. Um, in 1991, the Nepali Congress Party government was elected um, it engaged in economic liberalization, uh, freeing up of the media, and a lot of the changes that have now led to what we see as particularly uh, modern urban Nepal. Um, for example, um, literacy rates um, have, have risen, and I think of equal significance, the number of literate people in Nepal has also risen. So reading practices and the consumption of, of media have acquired considerable political significance um, in Nepal during the 1990s and subsequently that perhaps they didn't have when they were restricted to a small minority in the capital uh, before, that, before that date. Um, and also new, uh, new media have appeared, um, such as the two leading newspapers in Nepali and English, Kantipur and the Kathmandu Post. Uh, with an extensive readership in Nepal, online versions as well. The point I'm making is that we now have a much more informed um, population in Nepal, much more access uh, to print and electronic and online media as well. So a much more politically conscious population than has ever been the case before. During the 1990s, um, as is documented here, Nepal went through a period of um, especially after 1994, very profound political instability, um, with um, governments being created and, and falling with great rap rapidity um, after that date. And many of these are, were, were um, political co coalitions of convenience rather than any kind of real ideological coherence or any kind of manifesto or program. And after 1994, the, the, the increasingly well-informed public uh, became increasingly dissatisfied with the Nepali government's, successive Nepali government's failure to deliver on the kinds of promises that had been made with the reintroduction of, of democracy. Alongside this, the minority hill communities of, 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 of Nepal and the Madeshi communities of the Tarai region uh, began to demand measures to redress their, their historic um, marginalization and underrepresentation in every, in every part of the state. In 1996, due to a, a complex uh, series of um, political developments, um, the newly formed Communist Party of Nepal bracket uh, open bracket, Maoist, close bracket, um, announced that it was going to launch uh, a people's war, which it had called a Jamiyud. Now there had been a, a Maoist um, pro-Beijing line in, in, Nepali, in the Nepali communist movement since the early, early 60s. The Nepali communist party had existed since the late 1940s, um, roughly formed roughly the same time as the Nepali congress party. So there's always been a strong communist line in Nepali politics, um, although it has been you know, underground for, for many of the years since then. The beginning of this process um, is usually presented historically as the presentation of a list of 40 demands to the government by, by the leaders of the, of the CPNM. Um, 
with a deadline by which the government had to respond. Um, but in fact, the actual conflict, the actual first attacks on police posts in West Nepal took place before the deadline had even uh, expired. So the relationship between the 40-point demand and the opening of the actual conflict, the actual attacks, uh, at least to me, is not entirely clear. Um, but the leadership of this, uh, of this movement, first as a group of insurgents, and then subsequently in the peace process, um, both her having served now as Prime Minister of Nepal um, in recent years. On the left, uh, Babaram Bhattarai, uh, uh, a JNU uh, PhD, in fact. Um, and on the right, uh, uh, Pushpa Kamal Dahal, who adopted the nom de guerre of Pratanda, the awesome one. Um, the, the son of a, uh, of a school teacher. So these two men have been major players in Nepali politics ever since they launched their insurgency in 1996. The, um, the People's War, so-called, um, really remained more of a local conflict, conflict in Western Nepal until about 2000, uh, for the first three or four years. Um, and did not really impinge hugely on the political consciousness of the government in Kathmandu until around 2000 when the attacks stepped up in, in scale, um, attacks on police posts and, and any, any kind of institution representing the government in, in, um, in the hinterland. But the real turning point came um, on the 1st of June 2001 with the the massacre of King Birendra and his entire family um, at a family dinner in the Rainiti Palace on this particular evening. Um, the official explanation for which is that uh, Crown Prince Dipendra, on the left of the top uh, frame there, um, killed all his, his family because he was not being allowed to marry the young woman of his choice and that there was no relationship between this and the, the People's War, the Maoist conflict that was going on elsewhere in the country. Um, whatever the truth or otherwise of, of these explanations, um, the legacy of this massacre was a massive level of, of public distrust of the authorities and distrust of the explanation that had been given um, for, this, for this cataclysmic event. And... Um, the People's War, um, the internal conflict, stepped up in ferocity um, after a brief period of ceasefire um, from November 2001 onward, <coughs> lasting until, until 2006, passing through various periods. And I apologise for showing you some rather gruesome photographs, but these, these are the kinds of uh, issues that still remain to some extent unresolved. Um, on the top left... Uh, the aftermath of a conflict between the Maoists and the army in a place called Garm. The top right, uh, the body of a murdered uh, school head teacher, uh, murdered by Maoist activists and tied to a tree, refusing to pay um, a portion of his salary towards the party. Uh, on the bottom left, uh, Minus Sunwa, a young woman uh, or a girl, uh, abducted by the army and murdered and, and uh, buried in a shallow grave. Uh, and later exhumed, despite army denials um, of this ever having happened. And on the bottom right, um, a still from a film called The Living of Jogi Mara, uh, which documents the fate of widows and children left behind after the, the murder of um, they, their men, uh, husbands and sons, who were working as contractors on an airstrip in western Nepal. <coughs> so, one characterization of the conflict as a whole has been the way in which ordinary villagers were trapped between or caught between the two conflicting forces. The, the army now coming into the fray when they had stayed out until 2001 um, and the Maoists on the other side. So uh, effectively, you know, the, the vast majority of Nepalis being rural villagers, uh, politically more or less neutral in this conflict, um, found themselves targeted by both sides for supposed sympathy with the other. And from 2000 onward, 2001 onward also, uh, the conflict was um, pursued under 
army dictated conditions of emergency with very strict controls on, on the media. So you see here um, <coughs> a, a cartoon caption, uh, Press Freedom. Um, we have Maoist guns coming from one window and government guns coming from the other. <coughs> and between 2001 2006, the Nepali state virtually disappeared from many parts of the rural hinterland. And the Maoist main strategy was to um, encircle the cities from rural base areas in classic Maoist fashion, establishing people's governments in areas under their control. <clears throat> so there emerged from this situation a triangular political stalemate with the royal palace in one corner, uh, with the newly crowned King Ganendra, who had succeeded his murdered brother, um, with the army very much under the palace's direction. <coughs> The Maoist uh, party with its army in another corner in direct conflict with the state security forces. And in the third corner, the, the political parties who had enjoyed this brief sort of decade or so in parliament and in political power of some kind now very much marginalised and targeted both by the palace, uh, whose new incumbent was thought to be less than sympathetic to multi-party democracy, and also by the Maoists who sought to occupy the space they had previously occupied. <clears throat> so, in 2005, uh, King Ganendra did a rather foolish thing, I would say. He attempted, effectively, to take back executive power um, after a series of, of, of events, um, the details of which I won't go into now, but um, he effectively, on the 1st of February 2005, uh, arrested political leaders, human rights activists and so on, um, suspended the mobile phone network, took down the internet servers, etc. Um, and attempted to effectively re-establish something rather similar to the old panchayat system. Um, which led to this very um, famous poem, B.C. Nagachi Gilbian by Chavan Mukaro, a long poem um, which the words of which are supposed to come from the mouth of um, a tailor musician who was an advisor of King Pripyat Shah in Gorkha, addressing the king, saying, I've been with you for 250 years, how can I be a terrorist? Because those opposing the palace um, were increasingly being uh, dubbed as terrorists. And this was read in public and published widely uh, in 2005. Um, and this kind of sentiment and the eventual coming together of the parliamentary parties and the Maoists against the monarchy led to a second people's movement across the whole of Nepal in March, April 2006. So the king was forced into a corner by this coalition, a long last between the parties and the Maoists, um, and eventually agreed to reinstate the, the parliament, the House of Representatives, which immediately declared that the words His Majesties and Royal should be removed from all state institutions. Um, they placed the army under civilian control, began to announce that the king's inco income should be taxed, um, declared Nepal to be a secular state, and suspended the old national anthem. And the last point is one of something I've done some research on, which is the way in which the new national anthem was selected. The old national anthem, I will show you the first line on the very last slide, is simply a, a hymn of praise to the Shah monarchy of Nepal. The new national anthem is a celebration of Nepal's natural richness uh, and cultural, linguistic and ethnic diversity, with, with very few references to specific landmarks or characters or whatever, so a very strenuous attempt to uh, bring unity and diversity, so to speak. The interim constitution that was then brought in to to Nepal in January 2007 is very different to the definition of 1990. So we have no mention of monarchy, no mention of Hinduism. It's a secular 
inclusive, fully democratic state. Uh, shortly after this, the United Nations um, established a political mission in Nepal to oversee uh, what came increasingly to be called the, the peace process following a comprehensive peace agreement at the end of 2006, at the end of military hostilities. Yet the Madishis rose uh, against the new constitution uh, and, and the word federal became a very hot issue because of under-representation by the Madishis of Terai um, and the, what they saw as the broken promises of the interim constitution which did not uh, undertake to make Nepal federal as had been the demand for many years. I'm sorry, it's quite a long and complex story. I hope you're not getting tired. <laughs> um, I will try and draw it to some, to some conclusion uh, very, soon, very quickly. Um, the long-standing demand for constituent assembly elections uh, was granted eventually uh, in 2008. And Nepal elected a 601 member uh, assembly of incredible diversity because uh, on the one hand there was a, a there were, there were two elections simultaneously, one on a constituency basis and the other on a PR based basis. Uh, but the result of this was what no one had expected, which was that the Maoists um, came out as the single largest party. This was not what was supposed to happen. And this made everything rather more difficult uh, particularly, I would say, uh, for India next door, who had sponsored this process and supported this process to this point. One of the inevitable consequences of the Constituent Assembly election was that the, map, the monarchy was now abolished, and you can see a cartoon here with the, some local people counting down for the, the blast off of the palace from the Kathmandu street. And King Alendra leaves on June. 11th, 2008. So it leaves now, we have a, an interim constitution, we have a new national anthem. Um, the constituent assembly was intended to draft a new constitution for Nepal that would enshrine all of the objectives of the 2005 Six People's Movement and now was obviously dominated, uh, or at least uh, had a very strong showing of, of the Maoist party within it, with the expectation that they would pursue their own political agenda uh, very vigorously. And one of the main stumbling blocks for the constituent assembly process turned out to be this notion of, of federalism, because it was intended to bring about the greater inclusion and reduce the marginalization, particularly of the so-called indigenous minority hill communities of Nepal. Um, so a very contentious issue became this matter of how to restructure the state. And although a, many, a large number of other issues were agreed upon in the constituent assembly, uh, this remained sticking out as something that was very difficult to resolve. Uh, a compromise model um, was on the table, as were a number of others, um, but it never came to be uh, resolved and at the end of May uh, 2012 the Constituent Assembly was dissolved without having produced a constitution. Another process that had been undertaken um, from the early stages of the, of the, of the peace process for which the United Mission, Nations Mission in Nepal took uh, primary responsibility was the integration of the PLA, the Maoist army, into the Nepal army, um, as was intended, uh, was set out in the comprehensive peace agreement. This again became a very protracted and controversial process, um, which is only recently concluded uh, in October 2012. Um, with many fits and starts in the process, as one can imagine. But it is something that the Nepal government, I think, would like to probably hold up as a success, uh, in the sense that this was something that was set out to be done and has been achieved. Unfortunately, there are a large number of former competents who um, have 
um, being disqualified from the process at a fairly early stage, so represent a possible source of, uh, of disruption and dis un unhappiness politically in Nepal um, in the long term future. So we're not sure where things are going. Um, and it has taken a long time for the various factions um, of the Constituent Assembly, the various political parties, to decide on, on a way forward. The main problem has been that um, parties within the, the mainstream have been very unwilling to make compromises or make concessions to other parties because of the the great need that is felt to be the party in charge when general elections are held, um, or the elections for, for the new constituent assembly, which will continue the work of the old. So on the 14th of March this year, um, the parties agreed, as you can see on the left, um, to a rather startling development, which was to appoint the Chief Justice of Nepal's Supreme Court as the head of a new temporary government which would oversee the election of a new constituent assembly. So that's where we are right now. Uh, and the expectation is that elections to this new constituent assembly will take place in November of this year. Now, um, if we look at what the key documents are of the peace process, um, I would say probably the two key documents are the Comprehensive Peace Agreement of November 2006, in which a number of commitments are made, and also the Interim Constitution of, of January 2007. So the commitments that were made were that the King's powers would remove, be removed and there would be a vote on the future of the monarchy in the first sitting of the Constituent Assembly. That the Maoist PLA would be confined to cantonments under UN supervision, and the NA, the Nepal Army, would be confined to barracks, and that the two armies would be later integrated. Both of those things have, have been achieved. Um, the election of the Constituent Assembly, however, although it was probably the most representative body ever elected at national level in any South Asian country, it quickly began, became the, the site of inter-party power struggles and the vast majority of the membership found themselves with little role to play. Which may partly explain the fact that the CA, although extended several times, failed to produce a final constitution. A further commitment was made to restructure the state on the basis of inclusiveness, democracy and progression by ending the present centralised and unitary structure of the state. As I've said, this has not really been achieved, although debates have been very vigorous on this matter. Commitments were made to constitute a, a National Peace and Rehabilitation Commission and a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and neither of these, of these have been achieved, even seven years later. Um, and the, a bill to establish the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has recently been deemed to be faulty by the Supreme Court, so the process is still very much underway. This means that there are a number of human rights atrocities that continue to be un, unresolved, um, and those responsible still have not been held responsible for their, for their actions. There are still also, obviously, concerns over the implications of a Supreme Court Chief Justice heading an executive body and when he hasn't resigned from his judicial post. On the other hand, one can say, you know, there's the lethal conflict that, that took 15,000 lives is at least at an end, and the CPN Maoist is now a mainstream political party, although a minority faction within it has broken away now uh, and uh, has returned to many of the, the kind of, at least the ideological sloganeering that, that the conflict began with. The monarchy has gone, um, and I would say that this is partly because the institution had failed to evolve in a way that would ensure its survival. Um, 
abolishing the monarchy removed a major source of both patronage and corruption, um, but it also removed a political, a symbol of political and cultural unity that is quite difficult to replace. Um, in Nepal now, there's much greater sensitivity to issues of marginalization and inclusivity. But this is still largely on an ethnic and caste basis. There has not yet been much discussion of issues of class. Uh, so, whereas uh, those now termed indigenous, the hill communities, um, are, are, are seen as people that need to be brought into the mainstream, people who are from the higher Hindu castes, who are also you know, of, of a low economic status, uh, are not necessarily going to be beneficiaries of that kind of process. One weakness is also that the peace process is still heavily development, de dependent upon high-level consensus between senior national-level political leaders whose main concern is short-term political advantage. Uh, there's a concern about the fact that many human rights abuses that were committed during the conflict remain unresolved and increasingly swept under the carpet in some people's views. Um, there is this absence of elected institutions and bodies now um, so that much of the government apparatus has to work on a, a kind of a rather more ad hoc basis and the question of electoral mandate is, is, often, is often raised. Um, and finally, economic growth in these circumstances is very poor um, and the national economy of Nepal is increasingly propped up by remittances by, from overseas labour, particularly in the Middle East. So those are my remarks in conclusion. I'll just turn your attention to this rather wonderful cartoon that was published um, just as the Chief Justice uh, was appointed to head the new government. Uh, it's a line from the first, the old, it's the first line of the old national anthem, Sri Man Kampir Nepali Pinchanda Bhadavi Bhupati, which is, which is in praise of, of the king. Um, but the, the, the symbols here are on the, on the left, uh, Sri Man, um, and on the, on the seat it says Sarvocha Supreme, i.e. Supreme Court, and then it says Jaga Firta, um, place returned, we'll go back to place. Gambhir Nepali, profound Nepali, serious Nepali. And you can see how Gambhir they are by the way in which the man with the basket is propping up the large balloon of words coming out of the person standing next to him, who is Pratanda, uh, the supreme leader of the Maoists. To his right, Pratapi the illustrious, we see Babaram Bhattarai, the now ousted um, communist, uh, Maoist prime minister, standing on top of his, his Mustang Jeep, which is a, a Nepal assembled vehicle. <coughs> and then finally, the figure on the right, um, I have not been able to identify. Um, he's labelled Bhupati, so the landlord, the owner of the territory. Um, I don't know if the ambassador can help me here with identifying him. Um, some colleagues have suggested this is, is Baidya, the, the leader of the kind of breakaway uh, fundamentalist Maoists. Um, others have suggested that because he's, he's sitting there smoking a hookah, it may be intended to represent India. The land captured by the mouth, not it returned, let it be returned. Okay. Is the hole there, and at the end, Bhupati, the man who occupied the land, is the landlord. Thank you very much. That, that's my guess. That's, that's Jagat, okay, land, okay, return the land, yes, yes. Jagat, Jagat Pirta, okay. I, I, Supreme Court, there's a, right. there's a, but the, I wonder whether the absent chair might also be to do with the Chief Justice not being there. to the court to have the land returned and become the landlord is right there. Okay. Is okay. But, but, but the fact is, so the chair is empty. There's no chief and justice there. Yes. <laughs> um, so on the right, well, I would have to agree with the ambassador. Yes. Uh, some people have suggested that perhaps this is a suggestion also that Nepal's sovereignty is at stake. I don't know. Because of the hookah pipe. There should be some. Uh, some uh, 
ambiguity in the cartoon saying that. Indeed, indeed, intentionally am ambiguous. So I will leave you with that cartoon as, as, a, as, as a thought piece um, and a, a piece of a thought that is still very much in progress. So thank you for staying awake. <laughs> West of Nepal, in the Nepal Ganj area, um, there is a, a substantial uh, Muslim community. Generally, they have been relatively well integrated. There hasn't been a great deal of tension, if that's, if that's what you're referring to. There were riots in the southwest of Nepal to do with the Madeshi issue in 2007-2006. But there is not, I mean, there is, there is not a Muslim politics per se in Nepal. So I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. So they're not a politic uh, party in essence. No. Oh, okay. I mean, in the 601 people, there were. There will. I'm not absolutely sure. Sh- I, I, I would guess there must be. I mean, not a, must, uh, Muhammad, yeah, there were a Yes, I mean a small number. Not not at any senior level. I think. I think. I mean, there's Mos- is it no, Muslim Hamid yeah, in yeah, con- yeah. Congress? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. But the, the, the kind of communal politics that we've seen across North India and so on in recent, in, you know, in the last 10, 20 years hasn't really touched Nepal significantly. Um, I suppose, what, what, just thinking about it, I mean, there have been, there have been issues about the fact that um, for instance, when a number of uh, Nepali labourers were executed in Iraq uh, a few years ago, there was there was public revulsion and rioting in Kathmandu, and a number of identifiably Middle Eastern businesses were smashed up and this kind of thing. But that's a different matter, really. That's an international issue. Uh, first, I'd like to just express that I totally agree with you not the exact translation of what it tries to mean. Uh, if you look at the extreme right, it's a communist flag. The guy in the extreme right is still right there, who is from the splinter party. Sure. He still has the extremist idea. They have not even returned the land they occupied during the civil war. So it's not relating to the land reaching issue. Now we have the political parties, the two of the main leaders. They agree that the land should be returned, which was occupied during the civil war. But the faction or the splinter party, they still do not agree. So there was nothing to do with India, so it's typical Maoist illustration of division. And um, religion. Uh, thank you. I think I think you're almost certainly right. Thank you. And the next thing regarding religion and Nepal, Nepal has always been a quite a harmonious country. We have never fought for religion, and you need to understand how the social contract is built in Nepal. If you think of Buddhists and Hindus in Nepal, we do not fight for religion. It's even hard to differentiate the Buddhist and Hindu tradition in Nepal, for instance. So I think. If, uh, the whole idea of sectarian politics just in religion is not really. But at the moment, we understand Muslims are minorities in Nepal. There's been special measures to provide them with maybe proportional representation in the coming elections. Like if you think of 2006 Council Assembly, we brought Malaysians in a discourse of minorities. Now Muslims are also a part of it. So maybe new things will happen. Maybe the proportional representation will run from Muslims to that in the coming days. But it's harmonious. There is no conflict. I would I would agree with that, and, and um, I think what's no, there's more one, one could, I mean the, the whole sphere of religion religious identity in Nepal is is, is quite an interesting one, and um, particularly the Muslim community in Nepal. I mean, there's this new book by um, Megan Sijapati you may have seen. 
it's, it's fairly unresearched since Gavolio did his Minority Muslim book uh, many, many years ago. Um, the relationship between, between Buddhism and, and Hinduism in Nepal also is a very interesting one. As you say, particularly among Newars, I would say, in the Kathmandu Valley, the dividing line between the two traditions is very, very unclear. Um, uh, the classic example of asking a Newar, uh, you know, are you, are you Hindu or Buddhist? And the answer can be yes. <laughs> but there is also a clear division between, you know, Tibetan Buddhism and, and, and Hinduism. So th th there are different kinds of uh, Buddhisms in that part too. Assembly elections, when, when this very large Maoist uh, representation was elected in. And I remember the way in which, uh, number one, there was great surprise internationally and nationally at this result, but also the way in which um, I, I found myself attached to a British um, embassy in election observer team, and we went around polling, polling stations in, in the South Lundford district, talking to people, you know, not asking them what they were going to vote, but asking them what they were going to vote for in terms of the future. And they all said, Shanti la which means peace and security, peace and security, peace and security. Uh, and that's clearly translated into a pretty large vote for the, for the Maoists. And I think there was also a sense that the people had tried all the other parties and they had failed them. And at least the Maoists had a clear, a clear ideological agenda. <coughs> even though people may have found, found their methods objectionable, now that they had come into the main, mainstream and were willing to do, do politics in a more conventional way. So the expectations were pretty high. Um, I suppose they sort of dwindled away. They rose again a little bit when, when Balban Ambatrai was installed as Prime Minister in um, 2011. Um, but again, I think the feeling was that the, the Maoist senior leadership had come to Kathmandu, had turned into Nepali politicians, much like every, everybody else, had, been, had become corrupted by, the, by entering the system in some kind of way, which explains you know, the breaking away of this other faction within the Maoist party to sort of return to the ideological <coughs> starting point. So that's, that, that's my impression anyway, basically disappointment. They turned out to be like everybody else. I have a question which may be a bit far out, but it's about this thing about ambiguity, intentional and unintentional ambiguity. Uh, I also remember that uh, time when Nepal and India were at loggerheads, and the then Nepali foreign minister, I think it was a Congress person, old man in 91 perhaps, came to Denmark and he was asked this question in the Danish Foreign Policy Society, why is there this conflict between India and Nepal. And he said, I don't know. They never told us. We have no idea why this is happening. And now I want to draw a parallel and I want to hear your opinion about the parallel. The parallel. Uh, if you look at the relations between India and my country, Denmark, today, uh, there's at one interpretation there is a, an undeclared a diplomatic war going on because of the Karunia arms drop, which you may remember that was a Dane who dropped weapons over Western Gold from a small airplane in the 95, 96 or something like that. So, in one way, there is the hypo hypothesis that India is severely uh, uh, sanctioning Denmark in terms of visas, in terms of denying trade possibilities, investments, etc., etc for the last uh, two years, or around two years. Huh? At the same time, there are others, other statements which says there's no such thing. Everything is going on happily as before. 
So it's a, it's a very high degree of ambiguity in what is actually the relations between those two countries. Huh? So the Nepali case, you can say there might have been uh, clear sanctions for unclear reasons. Nobody really knew whether it was because India had, uh, Nepal had bought those weapons from China or whether they were slow in signing the new, and the new trade and transit agreement. In, in the Danish case, it may be um, the unclear sanctions for clear reasons. I really couldn't really comment on the, on the India-Denmark thing. It's way beyond my <laughs> expertise. On the Nepal-India thing, um, if the foreign, I can't remember who was the foreign minister in 91, would that have been Krishna, Krishna Sabha Dari was home minister, wasn't it? Yeah. Do you think the sanctions against the Australian Kumar Party sanctions were in the Panchayat Sure, sure, sure. So, of course, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that he was probably playing the innocent victim and he knew exactly what was going on, actually. Um, that, 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 was, that was kind of, we are helpless Nepalese, these Indians are being beastly to us. I think that was probably what was going on there, I, I don't know. But um, I would make the point that for Nepal, India is not really, is, is, is not really a foreign country in the same way that Denmark is. It's, it's, India is, is, is important in all kinds of ways for Nepal. The, the relationship is, is a very complex one, but a very close one as well. So, I mean, in the old days, people used to talk about, you know, they used to talk about Narayanidhi Darbar, the, the palace in Kathmandu, as being, you know, a source of power. If you wanted to get one up over your political rival, you went to the palace to try and secure a favour and patronage them. They also talked about Delhi Darbar, the, the other palace in Delhi. And if you look at all the, all the major changes in Nepali political history from 1951, 1990, and, and more recently too, there has been Indian involvement in some of that, uh, the nature of which isn't necessarily clear to a foreigner like myself. But at the very least, uh, consultation, um, 1951 is called the Delhi Compromise now, you know, the change from the Ranas to the, to the, to the 1950s. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an intimate, complex relationship between the Nepali political sphere and Delhi. Uh, and for any politician on either side to say, we don't know what's going on, I think is probably um, disingenuous. Mr. Justice, 
in the park, you know, you're shooting for a year ago. While starting your three, you will start three months. That's how we address the budget. Thank, thank and you. And the of course, is the literal meaning is the law of the land. And because uh, they have grabbed land promoters, therefore they are the lords of the land. I'm very pleased I showed you that cartoon because I now understand yeah. it much better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what I want to add. Thank you very much, uh, Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>